Hi, welcome to my first Q&A video. This is something new for me. Hopefully it takes off and you all enjoy it. And I just want to also mention, since I'm getting back into videos again, it's been a while. I'm going to redo some things, just kind of spruce them up. So you might see some changes on the intros and, and at the very ends of the videos, things like that. So uh, I'll experiment. If you like what you see, let me know. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, let's see, I also want to say, and I'll put this at the end as well, if you have questions for me, I'd love to have them sent in. The email address is winddownqa at gmail.com. And I'll put that underneath here and um, also at the end of the video. So I'll hopefully remember to remind you there. So I did have some questions already sent in, and I'll be starting with those. And I thought, well, I don't have quite as many as I'd like to have for the first time out. But uh, I went back and found some other questions in the comments. And uh, what we've got with me today, the first question and answer is, what am I drinking? This uh, Cabernet Sauvignon out of California. It's uh, no particular region. It's just a nice, easy drinking little wine. So I'll just start with that. Okay, the first question I have um, is also the first question I received via email, and this comes from Jessica. Love your YouTube channel. I am also a lover of wine. I'd like to know your thoughts on the creation process of champagne versus wine. Okay, well, first of all, just some technical things here. Uh, champagne is uh, a specific sparkling wine from a specific part of the world and namely uh, the Champagne region of France. Now, other sparkling wines are made elsewhere, but they're not officially called Champagne anymore. You might find a few exceptions here and there. Some of their grandfathered in been calling it Champagne for years. I know there's one out in California. I think they are changing. I'm not sure when or if they have already. I just haven't followed up on that. So uh, also, just regular wine uh, is of course called wine, but champagne is also referred to as wine. It's just a particular type of wine. In the sense that you have red wines and you have white wines, well you can also have sparkling wines. So let's uh, take a look at that. So the first thing, and I'm going to go over this kind of high level, I think this would make a very good video to do in depth, so I'm just going to touch on some high points here. Uh, first thing of course to make a champagne style wine and uh, the method that's used in champagne is used elsewhere too. So I'm just going to call it champagne style. If I say champagne, it's, it's going to apply that way too. Uh, the first thing you do is just make regular wine. And let's take a, a, a Blanc de Blanc champagne style wine. That uh, would be made basically, Blanc de Blanc means white from white. So a Chardonnay, for example, is a primary grape that's used in Champagne region to make Champagne. So if you did 100% Chardonnay, the first thing you would do is take your Chardonnay grapes and ferment them just like you would ferment any other Chardonnay wine. So after that's done, then they, in Champagne region, they go through some different evaluations. This is a really good year. Do we want to do this as a single vintage? And I'm not going to go into all that, but uh, champagne is not always single vintage. It might be multiple vintages combined into one, so very briefly. So they might decide, okay, yeah, let's make this, uh, this is what we're going to do with it. So after the, sh the wine is created as a still wine, Chardonnay in this case, then they go through some other processes. They uh, take that wine and to begin the sparkling aspect of it, the true champagne part, they go back and introduce a, a little bit of sugar and or raw juice and some yeast, put that into the bottle and then then put a cap on the bottle that's kind of like a beer bottle cap, it's you know, little crown things that kind of crunch around. And that what that does with the added yeast and being enclosed like that, the yeast produces Carbon dioxide, that's its natural by byproduct, whether it's regular wine that you're making or champagne sparkling wine. So it creates that yeast. Now in a normal fermentation, that yeast just kind of goes off into the air and uh, nobody pays any attention to it, basically. You can watch it, if you have the right setup, you can actually look at fermenting wine and you'll see bubbles coming up, just like a like boiling water type thing. Not quite that rapid or big bubbles, but you'll see bubbles coming up out of any wine that is in the process of fermenting. 
once the fermentation stopped, then the bubbles stop. So by introducing more yeast and a little bit of sugar or, or unfermented uh, juice, either way you're getting sugar into it, you're creating a food source for the yeast and adding some yeast into it so that yeast begins to consume the sugar and produce the carbon dioxide. So that's, that's uh, the next step. As this process is going on, that secondary fermentation, then what happens is you know, you've got your, your bottle here and it's got the little cork, not cork, but cap, like a, again, like a, a beer bottle cap uh, that you use the old thing to pry them off. It's not exactly that, but it's similar to it in concept. So that's on, it's fermenting, and in the, during the process of fermentation, and even after the fermentation has stopped, they do what's called uh, racking. So you take a bottle, I should have brought a bottle back here for demonstration purposes, so you've got it in there, and you gradually, over time, kind of twist it, and rotate it, twist it, and, uh, I'm sorry, twist it, rotate it, same thing, and then tip it up more, so you get, here's a pen here. So if this were the bottle, may start out horizontal in special racks and they just gradually turn it and steepen the angle. Now the purpose of this is to take those dead yeast cells and to get them instead of all spread out through the wine. As they die they tend to settle so as they settle in the bottom this way you want to slide them down to the, the uh, neck of the bottle, the end where the cork will eventually go. And you get it to the point where you've got all that accumulated down there. At that point, the wine can be chilled down and the actual end part of the bottle, the, the neck of the bottle, if it's standing up now, the very top part, can be frozen and you take that little accumulation of yeast and basically freeze it. That becomes like a little cork or stopper in it. So from there, your, your sparkling wine is ready to go except you got to get this little plug of yeast out. And uh, so you freeze it to make it solid, pull that out and as quickly as possible you refill the bottle with you take another bottle that's been opened and kind of top it off and then put the cork in so that way you don't lose a lot of the uh, the fizziness or the sparkling aspect of the wine now at this point they can also add in what's called a dosage that just is adding in essentially sugar to sweeten it up so you can have sparkling wines that are with or without the dosage. Now that just means that if they have it, they're going to be a little bit sweeter than if they didn't have it. It might just be a tiny amount, take it from a totally, absolutely zero sugar level up to just a little bit to kind of take an edge off, maybe just sweeten it up a touch, to all the way to a full on sweet one. So the dosage is the part where the, the sugar is added back in to sweeten it. And again, a lot of them don't do this, some of them do, so it can go either way. It may or may not state that on the label. I have one, for example, or well, two actually from the same producer. One is with dosage, one is zero dosage. So otherwise, the two wines are the same thing, just one's a tiny bit sweeter. And uh, so anyway, that, uh, you get that in there, you get the other, yeah, then you're, you've, you put the, the cork in it, after you've got it the dosage or at least filled it back up. If you pull that plug and it fizzes over, well, you're going to be short a little bit of wine, so you just want to top it off. So that could be with additional uh, sparkling wine from a different bottle. You just take the excess and you just fill, top off all the bottles until you uh, get everything set to go. So then you put the special cork in. They look kind of like little mushrooms when you pull them out. And I, again, should have one of those back here. Maybe I'll throw in some pictures. Uh, anyway, so you put that in, then you put what that little wire thing on top, and that little wire thing is called a cage. So that goes on and it's tightened down, and it just keeps the, the pressure inside from pushing that cork back out. So that basically is how you go from uh, still wine to a champagne style wine, champagne or sparkling wine in general. If it's made outside of France, it, will, it should be called something besides that. There's some different names for it it may or may not be the same grapes or the same process. So what I described is the traditional champagne method of making sparkling wine. Okay, so I hope that answers your, that question. We'll move on here. And I, I probably will do a video specifically on uh, our sparkling wine, how they're made, maybe go in a little more detail in some areas. But let's move on to the next question. This one comes from David C. He says, 
Very cool. Are you going to stock Lodi wines? I do actually stock Lodi wines in the store. I'm going to go in with the rest of this. He says, I live in California Central Valley. I have some good suggestions for stock from the Livermore Valley. Good luck. So Livermore Valley is part of California that does produce wine. And uh, Lodi is in and around that area. It's a very specific part of California. It's its own wine region. Lodi is very good wine. I enjoy it immensely myself. So the other part, you know, suggestions are great. The difficulty I have is liquor laws. And so this is not directly your question, David, but uh, to kind of explain why um, you, know, you can recommend them, I probably won't be able to carry them. I can only buy, buy my product that I sell to my customers from licensed distributors. And by that I mean someone who's licensed in the same state as I am. So I cannot go directly to somebody that makes wine in California and say, hey, I really like your stuff, ship me a couple of cases so I can sell it. The reason for that is it's a tax thing, and uh, as wine comes in and is sold to stores like me, it is reported to the state, and a tax is assessed, similar in some respects to a sales tax. So the state, of course, wants their cut, and if I get it directly and sell it, they don't get their cut. That's the problem. And uh, it, therefore, it's illegal for me to do that. Now, sometimes, uh, well, in fact, a lot of times, if you're talking California, the majority of the wine producers in California do not ship out of the state of California. Uh, not in a retail sense. There are some that will do their own wine clubs. So as people come out and they visit Joe's Vineyard and, oh, we really like your wine. Can we get that back in our state of Oklahoma or whatever? And the people at Joe's will say, well, no, because we only ship inside California to distributors here. However, if you want to join our club, we can get some of our wine to you that way. In some cases, they have that, some they don't. So, and, they, and the clubs do not ship to every state. So it's kind of hit and miss depending on which state you're from. So, yeah, the recommendation, recommendations would be great, but I just probably can't get them or I've already have them or something like that. But thanks anyway for your interest and I appreciate that. Let's go on. Uh, we have one from uh, Cyberfunk. Super Cyberfunk. So Super Cyberfunk writes, looking through your channel it looks like you haven't done a video on pairing wines with different cheeses. Could you do a video on that? Very good idea. You're correct. I've never done one on that specifically. I think I've talked about pairing wine and cheeses, which is kind of just pairing in general. But I don't think I've ever done one specifically on cheeses, so that's a good idea. But yeah, to kind of answer that implied question there, let's just do a few. Some guidelines, I guess you'd call it. Uh, you want your, basically like pairing wine with any food, you want it to match on its, uh, the strength of the, the food. So if you've got a really strong cheese, for example, you want a strong wine to go with it. You don't want to overwhelm the wine with the cheese or the cheese with the wine. So you have to keep those two in balance and keep that in mind. Now some of the cheeses, I'm just going to run a few off, that uh, basically your hard cheeses, uh, which are the ones you can, might have a, an aged cheese that's fairly hard, they tend to go better with heavier wines. If you're look, talking, uh, if it's a flavored cheese in some respect, for example, a smoked cheese, smoked Gouda comes to mind, you can also find smoked cheddars. Those tend to go really well with big, bold reds. Another thing that you can do with a red that's a little different size is the uh, blue cheese type things. Blue cheese, wrote for those styles of cheese, gorgonzola. They go also fairly well with big, bold red wines. If you're doing white wines, you probably want something a little bit lighter. Another um, in fact, a unsmoked, relatively young Gouda goes fairly well with most white wines. Swiss is another one to look at. Just naming off some of the common ones. Um, another thing to look at for pairing wines with cheese is the countries. If you have um, Spanish wine, for example, like a Rioja, you might want to get some uh, Manchego. I believe that's the right name for that one. It's a Spanish cheese made from um, sheep smoke. Yeah, really good cheese, real different flavor. I mean, it's not like, if you haven't had it before, it's nothing to be afraid of. It's not going to like gross you out when you eat it or anything. But it is a little different than other cheeses. Every uh, real good cheese has its own unique flavor profile, so I always enjoy that. 
Uh, something like a brie would want with a lighter white, probably, depending on how it's made. If it's just a straight brie, maybe wrapped up in uh, a pastry of some sort. If it's got a brie with a topping on it, then that topping might change what you would, which wine you would pair with it. So it's kind of a, a lot of individual taste and a lot of what do you like in cheese, first of all. If you don't like blue cheese at all, you probably won't like it even if it's paired with the best wine. So keep that in mind. You know, keep your, find your cheeses that you like and uh, find wines that go well with them. So it's a good, good idea. I am taking notes also. If somebody has uh, suggestions for new videos, send them to me. I kind of run out of ideas if I'm not careful and that makes it hard to make videos. So anyway, let's move on. Next question. John Smith writes, I had a 17-year-old Tawny Porto from Portugal. It tasted extremely strong of raisins, was brownish in color, and was undrinkable by me and my entire family. None of us had drank anything from Portugal before, and being new to wine, I thought maybe Portuguese wine just sucked, or that the style sucked. Now I realize that one bottle should not be the basis for any opinion on a country or region, and it, is, it was probably just bad out of the bottle anyways. We'll have to try another Portuguese at some point, but now I'm on the other side of the world and can't find any. Ha ha. Okay, so John, a uh, couple things in there. Uh, definitely what you're talking about, it was probably not a bad wine. Porto uh, used to be commonly referred to as Port, and that's kind of changed to Porto, which is the name of the, the town or region that it comes from, is a very special type of wine. It's not just a regular bottle of wine like you normally get and drink for dinner. Porto is what's called a fortified wine. It's one of um, several with this process. I won't go into the whole thing, but it's a very different style of wine. It's, it's a kind of a wine plus. So through a number of different things, you, get, you take the base wine and you add, in this case, brandy to it. So you're adding extra alcohol, and that was done for very specific reasons. It's usually on the sweeter side, and the way it's made does give it a kind of stewed fruit flavor. You mentioned raisins, and that's very typical. You can also get a little bit of prunishness with it. If you don't like that flavor or don't like the sweetness, a lot of ports, portos are very sweet. So that's another thing to keep in mind. If you don't like sweet wines, that may not be for you. But anyway, that is a type of wine, or it's a wine product. It's not a straight out and out wine. So don't judge Portuguese wines by that one, by any stretch. That is a very specific type of thing. It is similar in how it's made to uh, Sherry, which is, comes out of Spain, and uh, Madeira, which is also a Portuguese product, just a different part of Portugal. There are other similar things from other countries, but we don't need to go into those right now. They are not just regular straight wines. So keep that in mind. And I definitely recommend, and uh, you go back and try some more actual regular wines from Portugal, uh, the Douro region, same actual, same actual region around Porto, uh, has some just amazing red wines. One caveat to a lot of the Portuguese wines and many of the Spanish wines, you need to open them up and let them breathe. Don't just open it and start drinking because a lot of them are not good that way. Sometimes they're in much, much better the second day they're open. So again, decant them, maybe run it through an aerator or something like that first, but um, take a sip of it, definitely. If you like it that way, then you're good. A lot of times they'll be real out of balance until they've had time to open up. So definitely go back and try more Portuguese wine. It is wonderful stuff, one of my favorite regions, especially for reds. Okay, let's see. Little Painter writes, I found 16 bottles of wine in my garage. They have been there a few years at least. Some of them are definitely bad, but a few of them seem totally fine. I live in Florida, so it's pretty hot, but I don't want to waste wine if it's fine. So to kind of follow on to that question, yeah, if you've got wine sitting in your garage in a hot area, not a good place to store it. If you didn't put it there, somebody else did, you know, uh, you're, in, you're now in your parents' house, grandparents' house, and they put it there originally and you just found it. Totally understand that. Florida is a very warm region year-round and not a good place to store wine unless it's refrigerated or air-conditioned at the very least. So, yeah, if some of them are good, great. If, if some of them are bad, too bad. Um, can't do much about that. 
The only thing I would say for any that you have left, if you still have any left at this point, is um, yeah, bring it, bottle in, open it up. If it's good, drink it. If it's not, dump it, get another bottle, keep going. Just keep doing that until you, know, you find a good bottle and you're done for drinking for that night or that occasion. And if you don't, if you eventually get to the point where you're out of good ones, well, you had a few of them anyway. So not much you can do about that. Uh, the best thing, of course, store it in a good area. Don't try and keep them forever unless they're really meant to be aged for a long time. Most wine that you go to the store and pick up is really meant to be take it home, open it up, and drink it right away. Not to say you can't keep it for a while, but don't try and keep it 10, 20, 30 years because it just will not hold up well. Okay, next question we have. This one uh, in looking at was in response to uh, the video I did a while back on bad wine. So this is uh, Ron G writes, what if the cork is dried out? Okay, so can you drink it if it's dried out or is the wine any good? I'm kind of interpreting what the question would be there. Uh, the answer is if it's a dried out cork, you know, hope for the best but expect the worst is all I can tell you there. This happens when you take a bottle and store it upright and for a long period of time. The proper way to store it, if they have corks in them, if, uh, if it's a screw cap that's a little different, you can go either way. Proper way to store bottles is on their side, so if this is the end that you open, the cork is up here, the, the wine inside keeps that cork moist and that keeps it from drying out and shrinking. When corks are dry, they shrink. So if you get a brand new cork, you go to a hobby shopper or something like that, hobby store, and you're getting a, a, a cork, like a bottle of cork, maybe a bottle of cork, maybe not, it should be fairly, it'll be whatever diameter, pretty even around, same diameter across. And if you put one end of that in water, just regular bowl of water, it will start to swell up and get a lot thicker. So when you put a cork into a bottle after having filled that bottle with wine, if you're a winemaker, and it should be fairly tight to start with, but then when you tip it on its side well, and expose it to the wine, the bottom of it, it will soak some of that up into the cork and that will expand it, keep that cork in even tighter. So that you really do want a tight cork. Now, if you've got a bottle, you go to get it from wherever, you bring it home, you take the, the capsule, the foil part off, and yeah, it's all dried out. If it's dry on the top, that's not a bad thing. But if, you, if it's still tight enough where you, I assume it would be tight enough where you'd need a corkscrew to take it out, and it's dry all the way down, that tells you, of course, it's been stored vertically instead of horizontally then that wine may or may not be good. It depends on how long it's been dried out, how old the wine is. The only thing you can do there, put some in a glass, try it, and if it's good, drink it. If it's not, if, you, if it's a fresh bottle that you just got, take it back to the store, and you should be able to get it, exchange it for a good one. Uh, and in that case, if all of them are standing vertically on the shelf, you may just want to find something else entirely that's um, either horizontal or at least at an angle. But uh, yeah, if it's, if it's not good, take it back right away. If it is good, then yeah, fine, drink it. But do be aware of that when you buy bottles that are standing up vertically. If they're screw cap again, you should be fine. But uh, the ones that actually have cork in them, they should be stored at least for a long period of time. If they're stored for a long period of time, they should be laid down. Okay, the next one we have is Gage R. And Gage writes, could someone help me find out what is going on with my bottles? Just had, just had got four bottles of wine and all of them have these black flakes floating slash sitting at the middle and bottom of the bottle. Are these bad? <clears throat> okay, Gage, that kind of depends. Most likely it's not bad. Uh, it can go either way. Let me explain first what happens. When you take, and I'm guessing these are bottles of red wine and have been around for a while. So if they're like over five years, 10 years old, then this is probably what's happened. The, um, we've talked about tannins in other videos and things. If not, you can check them out. They're kind of someplace in my queue and I'll probably be doing more as time goes by. But anyway, tannins, those add structure to wines, red wines in particular when we're talking about tannins. So, those tannins, you know, what do we mean by structure? Well, it's kind of like you picture the tannins. They actually come from 
several things, the stems, the seeds, the skins. Also, if it's barrel aged, it can pick up tannins from the barrel. So you picture a tree, and this Ben's just getting a big workout today. So you picture a tree, and you know, you've got the trunk going up, and you've got these branches coming off the sides. Well, that picture the tannins like a tree with some branches coming off the sides. On a real tree, then, the next thing you have is a whole bunch of leaves on each one of these branches. Well, those leaves are your bits of flavor and aroma and flavonoids and um, all those other you know, sciencey sounding things that you find in wine. The things that we really are drinking the wine for. So the tannins kind of give a place for those items to rest for a time. So as that wine ages, the tannins, the actual chemical components of the tannin that give it that nice structure will start to break down. And when they start that process, that is when the wine is at its peak for drinking. So that means the tannins are now, so getting that rough, gritty feeling in your mouth, are now just smoothing out. and They're just real soft when you drink it. It's just, just like this. Just coats your tongue nicely and just slides right down your throat. Almost like drinking butter or something or drinking silk. They get really, really nice at that point. So, what can also happen with that is these tannins will kind of settle on to settle down to the lowest point. So, if you've got the bottle again on its side, then they'll settle all along the bottom edge. If it's uh, standing up, then they're going to settle at the bottom. So, you know, if it was stored properly to start with, or at the bottom, or on the side, when you turn it upright. Okay, we're pulling this one off the rack, or we're going to take it upstairs, or wherever. Sit on the kitchen counter, those can start to fall to the bottom. And in that process, especially if it gets shaken up, if it's not just, you know, carried from the cellar carefully up the steps with minimal motion, then those little flakes that have settled here are going to kind of get stirred up as the wine jiggles around, just like shaking a bottle of uh, anything. If you have... Um, Oh, that's a good example, like a bottle of, or a glass of lemonade or something like that. Some of the pulp might start to settle to the bottom until you shake it up and then it stirs it all around. <clears throat> or anything that's got some actual particles in it. So that's what's happening is it moves around and gets jostled around a bit while you're, those are coming off the sides or off the bottom and they're kind of getting stirred up into the wine. So the way around that, not necessarily around it, but if you... Um, if it's not all stirred up and already in the wine, where you can look through the bottle or see it in the bottle, then you can very carefully pour it, and it will still tend to stay in the bottom part. Now that last, maybe half a glass, is going to have where all that's going to accumulate. And it looks like little black flakes, and you described it pretty well there. Those will not hurt you if you drink them. I mean, they're totally safe. They're just kind of, yeah, maybe if you catch it on your tongue, you feel, oh, what's that? It's like a little leaf or something. They're not quite that solid. They are pretty dissolvable usually. It's almost like a, a, a liquid powder. But uh, they're not going to hurt you to, if you do drink some. It will just taste funny. It looks bad in a glass. So if you can carefully pour it, and if you notice a Bordeaux style bottle, it comes down with a real skinny neck, and then it kind of has what they call shoulders and comes down the rest of the way. So if you pour that carefully, that sediment catches in that shoulder. So if you leave some wine in there, as you tip it, you've got that little rounded spot comes up like that. It will catch in there if it's not already stirred up in the wine. Okay, the other alternative to that, and if you know you already have that, this would be the best way to start, is use a decanter. Now, I don't have one to show you right now, but you can certainly look for pictures. I'll probably find a picture for one, put it on here. But decanters often have, they're like about that tall, give or take, they can be taller or shorter. But they have a very wide base, like a little skinny neck and it's kind of flatten out and then back under. Part of that is to give, when you pour a full bottle into that, you've got an area about this size, or so, depending on which one you're using, of exposed wine. So you've got a lot of surface area. So decanting helps to aerate it. It gets, lets it breathe but it also helps to settle out some of that debris. So you can also have, uh, when you pour it in, there'll be like a little funnel that some will come with a little screen, like a tea strainer. 
you pour it through that and that catches a lot of those black flakes and things and then you throw those away but the wine goes through. You may still get some of that in there but they're not going to be the big chunks that you had without straining it or decanting it. So that's uh, something to look at, look for. There's different styles out there. There's, you know, worst case scenario, um, you know, pour it into something and literally use a tea strainer. They'll catch a lot of it. If you're not being real fancy, if it's just a casual gathering, you know, friends and family and nobody's all up in the air about it or, you know, all hoity-toity as we say, then yeah, just, you know, use it over their glass and pour it through there to catch it. I, you know, that looks kind of tacky, but yeah, worst case scenario, I, it makes it look better and once it's in the glass, it's just, you know, you don't want to hold a strainer over somebody's wine glass if you can avoid it. It just looks bad. It doesn't hurt anything. It's just appearances. It kind of kills the mood. So, um, yeah, the, and to sum it up, uh, the black stuff floating around there should not be bad. If the wine tastes good, now, I guess the other thing I want to follow up on that, if the wine has gone, I said when it, you start getting that, the tannins breaking down, the best time to drink it is right then or shortly thereafter, you don't want to give it another 10 years, that it will just go bad. So if that after its peak time, you can still have that stuff in the bottle, the black flakes and things, uh, it won't hurt you to drink it, but that doesn't, but the wine at that point may also be bad if it's been sitting too long. So try it out, open a bottle. If it tastes okay, after you've filtered out some of these things, you Again, they won't hurt you to drink them, just looks bad. It may give it a little weird texture if you get one on your tongue or something. But uh, if the, otherwise the wine tastes fine, then you're good to go. Just strain it out and carry on. That's actually a really good wine, presumably, or potentially. Uh, as long as it hasn't gone too far. But uh, if it's gone too far, it will just not taste good. And at that point, it doesn't matter if it has flakes or not, you're probably going to stump it out. So anyway, I hope that answers the question for you. And let's see, I have one more on my list. This is from Miguel L. Uh, I opened a bottle of Merlot Veneto one week ago, and my wife placed it in the fridge, the refrigerator. Do I still have time to drink it? If so, how much time do I have? Well, by the time you're hearing this answer, probably not. Uh, but no, that goes back to after you open a bottle, how long can you keep it? And a lot of that depends on the wine and the storage conditions and things like that. Red wines in particular tend to oxidize very quickly after they've been opened. So, and oxidation just makes it taste kind of flat and not that good. Uh, think of uh, soda or pop or whatever, a fizzy drink, after all the bubbles are gone. It just doesn't taste like it did with the bubbles going. It just tastes flat. Uh, same thing can happen with a wine after it's been opened too long. It gets kind of a flat taste. And that's just from having too much exposure to oxygen. If, uh, kind of rules of thumb, if you open a bottle and you pour some in, you know, to have a glass or two or whatever, and then you put a stopper, an airtight stopper in it, right away afterwards, it will keep for a while. Uh, definitely it should keep overnight, so you can drink the rest of it the next day. Often you can drink it uh, two days later. If you open it on Monday, stop it up and then reopen it on Wednesday, it will probably still be good if it's a red. Putting it in the refrigerator has also will extend it somewhat. It doesn't work as well, in my experience, it doesn't work as well with reds as it does whites. Whites keep much better if they're refrigerated after they've been opened. So it's kind of, you don't want to let it sit for too long. Now the other thing that you want to look at, if this is the wine bottle, you had one glass, you still probably got most of it in there. That will help because only that top part is getting exposed to air and you haven't gone back and forth and exposed it with multiple pores. So the more that's consumed out of it, the shorter the time that it will keep. So the best bet is open a bottle of wine and enjoy it with your friends and family and yourself of course right away. Don't try and keep it too long. If you, uh, if you know you're not going to drink it all, Maybe you want to do something different, just maybe not have it for whatever reason, or don't, if you've already had a bottle, maybe not open that second one. Kind of depends on your circumstance situation. There are some things, wine preservers, they call them, that you can, like aerosol cans, that they have inert gases. I've had limited success with those. The problem is when you take it and you squirt it in the bottle, like a little skinny tube, 
similar to what you've probably seen the compressed area used to clean keyboards, that type of thing, or DW40, an oil product. It's an aerosol can with a little skinny spout on it. Uh, of course, it's not easy, any of those. It's an actual inert gas made for this, but you can squirt it in there. But if you put it in the bottle, yeah, ideally, you wanna, if this were the bottle, you want to squirt it in and it just settles. It's heavier than air, so it covers the top of the wine and that keeps it from oxidizing. The problem is it's under pressure and it kind of it tends to blow it in and come back out. And it's, I found them just, like I say, marginally successful on that. I used to use them a lot and I, thought, I decided, no, these don't really work that well. I have just about as good a lock putting a stopper in and keeping it airtight that way until I'm ready to use it. But again, once I've stoppered it up, uh, when I, next time I open that bottle, the next day or two days or whatever, it is probably still going to be drinkable. It will be noticeably different. It will have opened up, possibly oxidized uh, a little bit too much, but still drinkable. If I stop it again and put you know, that last glass in the bottle back on the shelf, it's probably not going to be good the next day. So, kind of plan your wine out with that in mind. Drink it all at one time if possible. If not, stop it up tight so it's no new air is getting into it. And then um, when you are ready to open it up again, just plan on drinking the rest of it at that point. That's your best bet. So anyway, I hope that you enjoyed these questions and answers. I really would appreciate anybody who wants to send me additional questions. And the best way to get them to me is via email. I do run across the comments on these sometimes. Sometimes I don't see them at all until a long time later. I'm not real good at looking at those. I do have a lot of other things I have going on, so it's, I'm just kind of getting back into this, and I've just never been good at looking at the comments. So best way to do it is email it to me at winddownqa at gmail.com. And again, I have that in the end card. And uh, so... Looking forward to it. So this was Q&A number one and cheers.